All right, Doug. Uh, so yesterday you mentioned that currency controls or capital controls were inevitable in the United States. And I just wanted to spend a little time digging into that. Like what exactly are capital controls or currency controls and what, it, what would it mean for, for people who live here? Well, uh, every country in the world, or not every country in the world, but almost every country in the world, uh, has its own currency. There are exceptions. Uh, like um, Panama uses the U.S. dollar. Liberia uses the U.S. dollar. Uh, and there are actually a couple of other countries in the world that use American currency. They don't have their own national currencies. Um, so the people that live within a given country, you know, you use quaches in Zambia and pulas and Mozambique and Dirams and Morocco and all these countries have these these local names for their local units. Interestingly though, with a few exceptions like the US dollar, Japanese yen, a uh, number of other large currencies today, uh, those other those little minor currencies are worth nothing outside of the country that issues them. Now this is this is kind of interesting because the people that live uh, in the Congo, I'm trying to think, what the hell is the Congos? What do they call their currency? They might call it the Zaire, I even forget. Uh, but uh, if you're a citizen of that country or a resident of that country uh, and you wanna trade or invest or do anything, you've got to use the local currency. And that means that you're trapped. You're trapped like a lobster in that country if you're the average person because uh, nobody wants the currency that you do your saving in. Mm. Everything that you have is in that local currency. But it's, good, it's worth nothing outside of the country, so you're stuck there, okay? Uh, this is why these, the idea of a national currency is a disaster from the point of personal freedom. Uh, up until uh, the early 30s, uh, every advanced country in the world, uh, fr frankly, almost every country in the world, used gold for currency. I mean, the, uh, the US dollar was just a receipt for five tenths of an ounce of gold, five five hundredths of an ounce of gold. I mean, it said right on a $20 bill, uh, one ounce of gold payable on demand at the US Treasury. In fact, more people are gonna remember that before 1965, uh, dollar bills had printed right on them, uh, payable on demand, one silver dollar or words to that effect. And you went to the treasury or to a bank for that matter, a local bank, and you turned in your dollar, your paper dollar, and they'd give you four quarters. Okay, well, they'll do that today. The difference is that those four quarters were made out of silver that actually had a market value. And today, all you get is, is um, slugs, basically, made out of pot level that have, that have no market value, uh, no, they themselves. All right, so here's the problem. It's that um, at some point uh, soon, I think, uh, when the monetary situation in the U.S. gets bad, uh, Americans are going to find that their government is going to say, you're not allowed to take dollars or more than a certain number of dollars outside the U.S., that's taking wealth outside the U.S. We want wealth inside the U.S. Sounds like Trump speaking, actually, as I say this. Um, so they're going to restrict that. And they'll have all kinds of reasons for that. But um, it, it's going to collapse people's personal freedom. That's basically the drill. Why would, uh, so why would the, the government want, why would a government want to restrict the movement of capital outside of its borders? Why would they want to make it so that you can't take dollars out? Well, because when governments spend more than they take in in taxes, and they always do, they run deficits, 
and pass laws and regulations and do all kinds of stupid things, people with talent and people with money say, wait a minute, why do I want to stay here? I want to get the hell out. It would be like a smart, a smart Russian in the days before the Soviet Union collapsed. They'd want to get the hell out of there if they knew that if they got to the United States, you know, they could become wealthy and not be monitored. And be, so the talent and the money want to get out of these places that are going downhill. So um, you want to stop that from happening. If you have a nuclear engineer, you don't want him to go to work for somebody else. You want him to stay there and produce things. Otherwise, you're going to slip back to the Stone Age if all your talented people leave the country. So this is why governments love foreign exchange controls. And right. in the last few decades, we haven't had serious foreign exchange controls. But up until, up until about 1980, uh, most of the countries in the world had serious foreign exchange controls, draconian foreign exchange controls, where the uh, penalty for uh, violating them was uh, the death penalty. There used to be a guy named Franz Pick. Have you ever heard of uh, Franz no. Pick? No, no he, he died some years ago. But he was uh, quite a currency expert. And uh, he published every year a thick book, like, you know, several inches thick, that monitored every currency in the world. It was called Pick's Currency Yearbook. I actually have a couple of them from the old days. And... Um, it would, go, it, it would list the currency controls of every country in the world and the penalties for violating them. And they almost all had them. In fact, up until 1980, uh, Great Britain had serious foreign exchange controls. I remember when I was living in Europe in the 60s, one time when I was leaving Britain, and they asked me, I was just a kid, uh, they asked me, like everybody else, do you have more than 50 pounds of British currency on you? And it would have been serious if, if I did. I was taking it abroad with me. Wow. So, but I was a tourist. 50 pounds. And I was a kid that didn't have any money anyway. So it was an academic question for me. But uh, I think we could see that in the U.S. And, of course, as you know, right now, you cannot cross the border in the U.S. or really any country in the world with more than $10,000 of cash. You have to, you can, but you have to declare it. But then if you declare right. it, who knows where that's going to lead? Where'd you get it? What are you doing with that much cash? Why yeah, are you why, why would you ever need more than $10,000? What, yeah, what could exactly. you possibly be doing with that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, maybe we should take you back to secondary for, for further conversation. Just a little more screening, just to be sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it always, um, you it seems like the reporting of things typically precedes, uh, you know, uh, laws that might enforce it later. Mm. Right? So it's like, so, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, everyone is required to report it now and it's, no, oh, it's not a problem, you know, makes it easy for in the future for them to, you know, start to change the, the laws around it and make it so it's actually illegal to do it. It is illegal to do it if you don't report it right now. Yes. And actually, uh, this really started in earnest with the so-called Bank Secrecy Act of 1971. I remember it well because um, when I was living in Europe, I opened up a Swiss bank account. It was the easiest thing in the world to do. You just went down there and opened it up. In fact, how did I even manage to do that? I was a college kid that had no money and had no identification but an American driver's license. And the Swiss bank opened an account for me. I, I almost wonder how that could be, because today you, you open a bank account anywhere, you a sheaf of papers and, and so forth. Uh, certainly when I opened my first bank account when I was a kid, a little kid, like, you know, 10 years old or 15, 12 or something like that, I, was, I had no identification, but the bank opened an account for me. I, I actually asked, how did that happen? Hmm. So, so the entire world has changed. But anyway, with the Bank Secrecy Act, so-called, they, they love to give these perverse titles to their acts. Uh, that started the reporting. Americans from that point forward had to report all foreign bank and brokerage accounts. 
Uh, and of course, it's much more draconian now. We have so many laws that um, for, for, for reporting absolutely anything. And these governments now exchange information with each other. And um, so financial privacy, forget about financial secrecy, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get and, worse. And there, we, are, there are places right now, and I, I know you have a lot more experience with this than I do, where um, you know, it's just very, very difficult to move money in and outside of the country. And you know, people are pushed into virtually, basically into black markets and trying to conduct normal transactions. I, I remember you know, in trying to, um, and, and buying a, an, a, an apartment in Buenos Aires, you know, you couldn't just wire money from my U.S. bank account into uh, the seller's account in, in Argentina. Instead, if they, were, if they didn't have a, an account, if the Argentine didn't have an account outside of Argentina, like in the United States, like Miami, a lot of them had accounts in Miami, then you would have to actually bring in cash, U.S. dollars, not Argentine pesos, to the transaction. And so you're walking in essentially with a duffel bag of a couple hundred thousand dollars in order to be able to buy a piece of real estate. Hmm. Absolutely correct. And that still goes on in Argentina and in a lot of these countries. So and it's, it's, it's very inconvenient, especially if you're using the local currency <clears throat> where the largest bill is worth like $10 US. Right. I mean, it's, just, it's inconvenient. And it's actually dangerous because in countries where that's true, uh, surprise, surprise, there's usually a lot of street crime and poor people that want to steal it from you. Yep. So yeah, that's that's that that's absolutely that's absolutely correct. Uh, I, I wonder, Doug, when you you said earlier, you said countries impose these when a monetary system gets bad. That's what you, you. That's what you actually said. When a monetary system gets bad, what, what do you mean by that? What are the What are like the warning signs, and what does it mean for a monetary system in a country to get bad? Well, there are three ways a government can generate revenue for itself. Uh, governments are pure consumers; they don't produce anything. Okay, so what are the three ways, based on the fact that they don't produce anything? Uh, that they can get revenue to do the things that they want to do. Well, they can tax uh, and take as much as they can from people that way. Or they can borrow, sell their bonds, which is just really putting the taxes off into the future, plus interest. Or through their central banks, they can print money and pay their bills that way. That's how governments get money, but they're all disastrous. So um, in the case of the United States, where most of our listeners are, uh, taxes are high and going higher. I mean, sales taxes, they almost didn't exist uh, in most states in the country uh, up until up until the 70s. I mean, frankly, there weren't any sales taxes. Mm. And then they were 1%, 2%. And now you're talking 10% sales taxes in various places and various other taxes. So uh, income taxes, okay. And people don't like to pay income taxes. It comes right out of what they earn. So governments borrow money. And the government, the U.S. government right now has official debt it's hard to keep track because it's, it's going up hyperbolically at this point, but it's about 26 trillion right now. Uh, probably, what is that, up 25% in the last year? I can't even yep. keep track of the numbers. It's, yeah, it's, it's like, going so fast. Yeah, it's watching the dial click over and it's gonna be another 3 trillion, perhaps before the year's over, mm. uh, and it's not gonna end. So uh, they can borrow. And the borrowers, uh, it's, it's like an old maid card. That debt's never, ever going to be paid off, at least in dollars that are worth anything, which leads us to the third thing, which is inflation. Just print more new dollars. Forget about borrowing. The Chinese and the Japanese were very nice lending the U.S. government money in the past. Now they're selling all their paper. So who's buying? All, who owns all this? 
the American people and the American Central Bank, called the Fed. Uh, but what the Fed does is it prints money up. So it's, this is going to get totally out of control. And uh, to try to keep things under control, it's going to be very much like what Nixon did uh, back in, um, when did he do this? In the early 70s. He put on, he put on wage and price controls on everything. Mm. Uh, along with mild foreign exchange controls too, incidentally, so that the the price of gasoline was fixed, the price of apples in the market was fixed, the clothes you, everything was price controlled because they were at the time uh, it was the welfare warfare state. We had the war in Vietnam; they needed money for that and uh, expansion of welfare domestically. Where are you going to get the money? So they were printing it up, but then prices started rising radically. Didn't want that to happen, uh, it, but it's going to happen. But it's going to happen again. I mean, Nixon I, and, and, had to take them off because horrible president, president from absolutely every point of view. But uh, it's it's going to happen again. Well, and so if I if I uh, wasn't alive quite yet, but in that sequence, so there was um, you know the welfare warfare state wage and price controls. And then because of, and then there started to become capital flight where, you know, people were exchanging their dollars, you know, for, for gold. And that's, and then he closed the gold window to stop that, the wealth from essentially leaving the United States. Exactly. And up until 1971, uh, of course, Americans couldn't own gold at that point, but uh, foreign governments were allowed to exchange their dollars that they had for gold from the U.S. Treasury at a fixed price of $35 an ounce. Then he raised it to $42.22 an ounce, (laughs) arbitrary, completely arbitrary numbers. And then he cut that off, closed the gold window. So uh, right now, the U.S. dollar is an IOU nothing. I mean... It's worth something. If you go down to the Chevy dealership and buy a car, yeah, okay. But there's no guarantee as to how, what kind of a Chevy, uh, how many Chevys you can buy for a million dollars. Look, uh, the U.S. is turning into a third world country where at some point foreigners will not want to accept dollars. And here, here's a how many dollars are outside the U.S.? The major export of the U.S. Uh, for, well, about 40 years has not been computers or Boeings or wheat. Our major export has been dollars. And it's resulted in an artificially high standard of living uh, because the dollar has become the international currency. I mean, years ago, it was true, and it's still true today, I'm sure, that there are more $100 bills floating around in Moscow alone than there were in the whole United States. I mean, that was the meme that came out. Is it true? I don't know, but it could be true. Um, So our major export for many, many years has been dollars because people will take them, definitely. Anybody in an African or Mideastern or almost any Asian country, any South American country, they all prefer dollars to their local worthless currency. So, of course, it's been a great scam for us. We send them dollars. They send us Mercedes and Sonys. That's a great trade in the short run. But now, and once again, nobody knows what the number is probably something on the order of 20 trillion. I've heard 40 trillion, but nobody knows. So this is guesswork. You take the annual uh, balance of trade deficit, which averages 600, 800 billion dollars, not counting illegal trade for things like cocaine and so forth, which is huge, and uh, added up over 40 years. Yeah, it's someplace between 20 and 40 trillion dollars that are floating around out there. Like I said, there are four other countries in the world that use dollars as a, uh, their national currency, and there are at least 50 or 60 that use it as a de facto national currency, 
Argentina being one of them. Nobody wants to use pesos if they can get a hold of dollars. Right. So uh, what's going to happen when, with the U.S. currently uh, creating trillions of new dollars every year, at some point, retail prices are going to start skyrocketing. They're going to start moving up, not just 5%, but 10%, 15% per year. Now, these people are going to want to get rid of dollars, okay? Uh, and ultimately, since somebody, somebody in Mexico might want dollars now for good reasons, but he doesn't have to take dollars. He has to take pesos. That's the law in all these countries. Right. You've got to keep, take the national currency that's printed by your national government. But there's no law that says anybody has to take dollars except for Americans in the U.S. So at some point, these dollars are going to start flooding back into the U.S. There's 20 billion, 40 billion that are outside the U.S. In exchange for what? Well, in exchange for everything. I mean, everything that, that's for sale, stock certificates, land titles, goods of all types. So we get the dollars and they get the real goods back. It's really going to impoverish the U.S. It's, it, it's a scary thought because the whole world financial system is structured around U.S. dollars at this point. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. government destroys the U.S. dollar. It's not just going to be chaos in this country. It's going to be chaos because of this country all around the world. It's scary. Hmm. You know, there, there was a, I know we've talked a little bit about the Fed coin before, and it seems to me that the, um, all the central banks of the world are really working on uh, a central, what they call a, a CBDC, central bank digital currencies. And essentially, it, um, it, you know, the, there are white papers published earlier this year by the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England and, and the Fed's published some as well. And they basically explaining, you know, how, how it might work, like how these, the Fed coin rollout might work. And it, it seems to me that this, that they, you know, they can see all of this coming. They can see that the, there are going to be consequences with what they're, what's being done with the currency. Um, you know, and they're certainly afraid of deflation more than anything else. And it seems to me that the, the idea is that they'll that is to introduce uh, the Fed coin sort of alongside the U.S. dollar for a while, you know, get people to sign on to that, give money away essentially to people that are these, um, you know, these uh, the, what do they call it the the uh, uh, I can't remember what they call it the monthly income, you know, the that they send to everybody. Mm, guaranteed annual income is the exactly. concept. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that. Basically, that they that they get people on board by first doing it through that mechanism, but then uh, I think the thought is that within that framework, if you can trap the currency essentially within this electronic framework, that they can essentially make the currency disappear or expire, you know, or and, or introduce new currency units essentially immediately on demand, that they might be able to counteract some of these. Um, some of the, the basic consequences of uh, all the decisions that have been made over the past several decades. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's inevitable at this point because the whole world is going electronic and the good thing from the controllers, from the, um, the elite's point of view is that uh, when something's electronic, I mean, you know what people have and if your bank account if there is no cash currency anymore and it's strictly digits on your iPhone and your account is with the Federal Reserve itself, well, they can put money in, take money out. They can block your account the way your credit card can be blocked if, if you don't pay your bill or, or toe the line. So this is, this is really a, a huge disaster from the viewpoint of individuals that like personal freedom and personal flexibility. Everything that you buy and everything that you sell, everything that you own and everywhere, you, it'll all be an open book to the people that can look into your digital currency account. And it's on the way, there's no question about it. They'd like to get rid of cash and they'll say, well, 
We use cash is used for illegal activities like drugs and so forth. Well, I don't personally imbibe drugs, but I think anybody, your, your primary possession is your own body. So if you want to do drugs, I mean, God bless you. You should be able to do drugs. I mean, my body, my choice, right? Yeah, exactly. But uh, <laughs> no, it, we're, we're really moving into a very locked down world. And the, uh, what we're seeing now with this COVID hysteria, where the whole world is locked down, is I think it's a shade of things to come in many, many different ways. Yeah, and it's amazing how um, we have this whole body of regulations um, that exist of, that allow health departments to sort of circumvent civil liberties and other, you know, basic laws. So, you know, the, in the name of health and public health, you know, the uh, local and local state and federal governments can do things that, you know, seem previously totally unimaginable in the name of health and certainly like eliminating currency. I mean, you saw the whole thing with the, and I feel like this is part of a giant psyop at this point with the Chinese, where they're basically sanitizing, you know, all the, the renminbi currency that was circulating to get, making sure, you know, that people were new to give us this idea that even touching and exchanging currency was dangerous, you know, uh, could spread the disease. So you had to be so careful. And, um, you know, it seems like it's just accelerating all of these trends that were already there in place. Yeah, my only, my only question is, how predictive is the movie V for Vendetta, which came out a few years ago. I loved that movie, uh, but I think that that movie is probably too optimistic because it showed the people uh, overthrowing their big brother kind of type government at the end. And I'm afraid that the average person, uh, especially after they get uh, guaranteed annual income and things like that, which all these governments are planning, that the average person is just too much of a whip dog to do what the citizens at the end of V for Vendetta did. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the hope, the, I guess the only hope is they all ended up, they were all living in that situation with Big Brother for a while. And it was like once they experienced, you know, being under the, under the, the thumb of Big Brother, it was, there were a certain number of them that were willing to cast it off, I guess. And so maybe, maybe we really need to, to get the government and society and culture that we deserve before we'll do the right thing and earn the right to have something better. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm a great believer in people getting what they deserve. Uh, I, I really am. That's why I hate whiners and complainers. Yeah. Well, sure. Sometimes I complain or whine. We all yeah. do. But <clears throat> I've got no, no respect for myself or anybody else when they whine and complain because you basically make your own, yes. you make your own, your own bed. That's <laughs> and right. so if these, if, if these stupid chimpanzees keep voting and supporting in, in, in the name of democracy, which is a, which is really basically a sham today. I mean, it wasn't when it was originated in, in Athens 2,500 years ago, but it's a different world today. So we, we don't have democracy. Well, how did Ben, well, even a democracy is very, you know, uh, problematic in many ways anyway. I mean, what was Ben Franklin's uh, way of describing it's uh, a democracy? It's when, um, you know, two wolves and a sheep um, decide, you know, what's for lunch or something like that. Wasn't that his, uh, his quote? Yeah, well, that's right. And, and there are a couple of good quotations from Winston Churchill. The famous one is, well, democracies of the worst political system there is, except for all the others. Right. But then another quote, which I think was more opposite from Churchill, is he said, the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. Uh, I, think, I think that was really more accurate. And that's the way he actually felt about it. Mm. Uh, I have very mixed feelings about Churchill, however, uh, a yeah. very problematical guy, smart, very problematical. So, how's this all going to end up? Um, well, trends in motion stay in motion until they reach a genuine crisis, at which point a new, a new trend starts, uh, which can be worse than the old trend or better. But, um, you know, historically, 
uh, when the old regime is overthrown, the new regime is worse. And the, and the two most important revolutions in world history were the French Revolution in 1789, where after they got rid of uh, the old regime, it got worse under Robespierre. And the Russian Revolution got rid of Nicholas II. It got worse under Lenin and worse again under Stalin. So I'm not looking forward to the current tr negative trend uh, that we're experiencing in, in just about every way possible, financially, monetarily, economically, politically, sociologically, uh, culturally. You know, these, the uh, downgrade and all these things is very much in motion and seems to me to be accelerating. Won't go on forever, but when that real crisis is reached, I think it's going to be breathtakingly um, scary. Yeah, I think there's no doubt. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, you know, as it relates to the capital control component and, and the other elements that are likely to, you know, to restrict people's freedom and to, um, you know, sort of take control over people's uh, wealth and property. I think, you know, th there are things that people can do, but you really got to, you really got to be aware and be thinking ahead of it and sort of understanding what, what some of the options are or, or what some of the actions of an overzealous government, um, you know, might be. And I think capital controls is one of the biggest ones that trap the capital in a specific geographic location, and then they can take control over wealth, whether through taxation or just outright seizure. I mean, um, and, you know, one of the things that just the last thing I want to um, talk about just real quick is, is an example of how this can be done is, you know, the, the woke crowd today is one of the, one of the major um, things that they've been talking about is canceling rent, cancel rent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea under the guise of, well, we're in a pandemic and how can you, you know, people have lost their jobs and you can't just kick people out and increase the homeless population today in, in this terrible environment. So we want to cancel rent. And this idea is, um, it seems again, like the kind of sympathetic thing to do. You know, you don't want to put a single mom out on the streets, you know, in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. So it, it hits everyone's sympathies in, at first, initially, but the consequences of it are, are pretty astounding. And, you know, by essentially what they've, what they've done is they put a moratorium on, uh, you know, foreclosures and, um, uh, and uh, what is it when you, not when you, um, evictions. evictions, yes, uh, they, a moratorium on evictions. And I mean, so through a, a simple trick of using the law, only applying the law in some circumstances, you can, you could essentially take the vast majority of the, of the private property that's owned in the United States that's, that's available for rent right now. And, and it could end up in the hands of the government very quickly. And all you have to do is you basically, you, you deny people, uh, the ability to evict people who are non-paying, but the, but of course they're still obligated to pay their mortgage payments on the real estate and they could since very easily seize the property from the, from the property owners. And, and by the way, I think the fed owns right now, something like two thirds of, of all mortgages in the United States anyway, because of the, the money printing they've done recently. So to me, it's, it's almost through a little trick of the, of, of, uh, of the application of the law, only doing it in some places and not in others, you know, so much of the private property of the U S could be owned by the government in six or nine months. I mean, it can happen in the blink of an eye. And I think people don't take the cancel rent thing seriously. They think they're joking, but I think the whole idea is to, is the transfer of wealth. I think that's the whole point of all of this. Yeah. Once the government owns all these things, they're going to look like the projects, uh, Cabrini green or Pruitt Igo places like that in Chicago and St. Louis and Detroit. It's, 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 it's just, it seems like there's no way out at this point. Of course, the average person or, or our listeners are probably wondering, well, what do we do about this? And um, there's a bright side to everything. Um, I've been a gold buff since it was $35 an ounce, and I've never sold an ounce of gold. Ever. I just buy it, keep buying more, buying more. It's a great way to save. It's panned out a lot better than just saving dollars in a bank. Uh, but uh, 
gold is going to go a lot higher, I'm afraid, even though $2,000 an ounce sounds like a lot. It's going to go higher. Uh, but you can speculate as the government creates trillions more dollars that flow into society. You've got to ask yourself, where are those dollars going to go? Hmm. They're going to create more bubbles. They created a real estate bubble uh, back in 2008. They created a stock market bubble back in 2000. There's another stock market bubble now and a bond market bubble and in many places even a real estate bubble. Um, but the next bubble is going to be in commodities in general, gold in particular, and the stocks of companies that mine it. Gold stocks are the most volatile class of securities on the planet. Mm. And... Uh, they're, they're very cheap now, actually. That's a whole separate conversation we can have. But uh, they're going to go to the moon, I think. And you can make a fortune. So after you do that, then what you've got to do is diversify your assets politically so they're not where one government can get hold of all of them. You've got you to diversify among Im investments. Everybody understands the wisdom of that. But you've got to diversify politically because you're – the political dangers to your wealth and your health are much greater than the market or economic dangers. So you've got to diversify outside of the U.S., outside of Canada, outside of wherever you are. And one of the or, you know, one of the things relating to what we talked about yesterday, one of the simple ways to do that is buying a piece of property that's outside of, of the United States. So you've got a, a bolt hole where you don't mind spending time anyway, and you know that gives you. Um, it's, it's not a financial account or anything like that, but it gives you a real asset in a, in a real place in a different political jurisdiction uh, to hedge your bets. Exactly. And the chances are, as a foreigner owning a piece of consumer real estate, uh, you're actually safer than a local because, as we pointed out yesterday, they tend to treat foreigners as valued assets. Yes, it's true. In the past, some of these crazy governments will nationalize foreign holdings, if you're Exxon or if you're United yeah, Fruit. You know, that's, yeah. But uh, not consumer goods, because consumer goods are actually a liability for almost everybody. Yeah. Frankly, they're, they're cost centers, not profit centers. Mm. So, no, it's, it's uh, wise and safe uh, to, uh, to do that, in my opinion. Good. Okay. So, bottom line, currency controls are coming to the United States could be in six months, could be in six years, but they're going to have to come because of the monetary situation. There's no doubt about more it. More like six months, I'd say. Well, okay. probably a little bit more than that, but it's not going to be as long as six years, I don't think. I don't think so either. Okay, so use that information as you can to help yourselves. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep the conversation going and come back to this again on Monday.